Hello and welcome. I'm Hannah Saunders. Um, I'm a researcher at Queen Mary University in London, and I've been researching barriers to equality for people with disfigurements and disabilities in the workplace. Just to let you know, this session is being recorded um, and it will be circulated afterwards to anybody who wasn't able to be here today. I'd like to thank ACE and Dalvinda for allowing me to come along and join in the discussion today. And I'm born, joined by some really amazing panellists who I know are going to have lots of brilliant insights on this topic. So I will ask themselves to introduce, I will ask them to introduce themselves in a minute. Just before I do that, just a few housekeeping points, if I may. We want this to be interactive and we want to hear your thoughts. So please do type in comments and questions in the chat box as we go through. Um, if you prefer to speak, then please just raise your hand and I'll come to you as soon as, as, soon as there's a, a quiet moment. It would be great if you could keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking, just so that we can all hear clearly. And finally, if there are any accessibility requests that we can manage on the day, like repeating a question or speaking more slowly, then please do pop that in the chat box and we will obviously do our best. So I'm going to come to our panelists now and ask them just to give a, a brief introduction to, um, to themselves and to their roles. So Jane, could I perhaps ask you to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Welcome everyone. I'm Jane Hatton and I'm founder and CEO of Evenbreak, which is a social, social enterprise, enterprise run by and, and for disabled people. Thank you, Jack. Hi, my name is Jack Arnold. I'm a construction engineer at the Robert McAlpine. I also chair our disability inclusion group. Wonderful, thank you. And Vanessa? Hi, I'm Vanessa Curtis. I am a chartered surveyor by background. Um, I also have ADHD. And I'm founder and chair of Ability RE, which is a non-profit um, set up to promote inclusion and opportunities within real estate and the built environment for people with disability or neurodiversity or long-term health conditions. That's perfect, thank you very much. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that I'm going to hand back to our panelists in just a minute, but, but first I wanted to give you a very brief overview of what the session is about. So inclusive workplaces for disabled people. Now that word disabled, I find tricky because I think it can mean different things in different contexts and to different people. So in a legal context, many of you will have heard of the definition of disability that's in the Equality Act. So a physical or mental impairment, which has a substantial adverse effect on the ability of the person to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. That's, that's one definition. There are others in some other pieces of legislation, but actually there's a more fundamental, fundamentally different definition of disability that we wanted to talk about today. And that's called the social model of disability. So the social model tells us that disability is socially created. In other words, disability doesn't flow from having a particular physical or mental difference, but from the way that society interacts with that difference. So the disability of somebody who can't walk stems from barriers such as inaccessible buildings and I was in London yesterday, tube stations where the lifts aren't working at all. What is great about the social model of disability is that it puts the focus on the barriers external rather than blaming or labeling the individual. And in a workplace context, there are lots of different types of barriers that people can encounter. So some might relate to the built environment, some might relate to attitudes of other people and stereotypes that exist within society. Some might relate to organisational processes, things like recruitment procedures, perhaps that aren't as inclusive as they could be. So in our session today, we're placing the focus very much on workplace barriers and particularly on practical steps that employers and, and in fact that we can all take to remove those barriers. So with, with that in mind, I'm going to hand back over to our panellists and ask them each to spend perhaps five to ten minutes telling us about their experiences and their work um, relating to workplace barriers. 
So if you're all happy, I'll, I'll keep the same order as last time and, and hand over to you, Jane. That's great, thanks. Yeah, and thank you for um, sharing the social model. Everything we do at Even Break is based on the social model. So basically there's nothing wrong with disabled people. What is wrong are the barriers that we face in society that might prevent us from participating. So everybody at Even Break is a disabled person. So that might be someone with a neurodivergent condition or a mental health condition or a physical disability or sensory impairment. And we learn from each other every day about the barriers that each of us face. But we wanted to look more deeply into the barriers that disabled people face when they're looking for work. And we commissioned the University of um, Central London to do some work on our behalf a couple of years ago. And they did a survey with um, over 700 disabled people who were looking for work and basically said, what are the biggest barriers that you face when you're looking for work? And maybe surprisingly, the biggest barrier that came back overwhelmingly, 84%, said that the biggest barrier that they faced was not knowing which employers would take them seriously. And um, what they were saying was that, you know, every employer these days says we are an equal opportunities employer. But actually what we know from our own lived experience, that that's not always the case. And sometimes when you talk to employers about diversity, they tend to focus on race or gender or LGBTQIA+, um, or maybe two or three of those. But disability often comes much lower down the list. So what candidates were saying to us was when we apply for a job with an organisation that says they're inclusive, often we find out that they're not inclusive when it comes to disability. And so when you've had a lifetime or a, a, a you know working age time of constantly being rejected, for no reason other than being disabled, nothing to do with your ability to do the job, you actually become less inclined to apply for, for organisations. So the thing I learned from that was, it's really important for employers to be explicit about being open for disabled talent um, in adverts, on their websites, where you know showing case studies, whatever it might be, to really work hard to say to disabled candidates, we want your talent. Uh, we're not going to be put off by the fact that you face barriers. We need to know about those barriers so that we can remove them. So that was the biggest barrier. The second biggest barrier was, again, going back to the social model, were the barriers that candidates found in the recruitment process itself. So things like CVs and interviews, which we traditionally use in terms of assessing candidates. And CVs, for me, only represent previous privilege, not future potential. So if you've been discriminated against because of a characteristic that's nothing to do with your ability to do the job, your CV isn't going to look as impressive as someone who hasn't been discriminated against. So it might be that a disabled candidate hasn't had the same opportunities in education or the same workplace opportunities so they may not have had the opportunities to really show what talents they have and their CVs won't reflect their brilliance. And similarly with interviews, I think, you know, we all know that people who really shine in interviews are people who are confident and extrovert and have great people skills and, you know, maintain eye contact with the panel and have very snappy answers to questions. But those people might not be the best person for the job. The best person for the job might be the candidate that kind of slinks nervously into the room and fidgets a bit and looks at the floor and might stumble over their words a bit, but might actually have all the skills that you need for the job. And so I think for me, that, that tells me that as employers, what we need to do is find different, better ways of assessing people's suitability for a role. So that might be a work-based trial. It might be giving someone a task that relates to the things they'd have to do if they got the job so that we're actually assessing candidates on their ability to do the job not on their ability to talk about it or on you know any past privilege that they they might have had and then the third most um uh, the biggest barrier of for disabled people was actually confidence in themselves because we live in a society that really looks at the medical model rather than the social model and the medical model kind of says there's something wrong with disabled people they need fixing they're not as good as other people and actually even as disabled people ourselves we 
kind of imbibe that that kind of um conditioning and start thinking that oh yeah I must be less than other people I became disabled at the age of 44 and I'd been in this field for years and yet it took me two years to stop focusing on what I couldn't do and start remembering all the things I said to employers about actually disabled candidates are premium candidates because we've learned to navigate around all of those barriers in our places so for me those are the three biggest barriers and the ones that as employers we really need to tackle the most and obviously I have ideas about how we might do that. That's amazing thank you very much Jane. Um, shall I hand over to you Jack? Yeah well, thank you for that. Um, just to give them contact I my my disability is I'm deaf and I've been deaf since I was born. Now coming into the industry from university and education, I would always tell, don't tell anyone you have a disability, then you know, wait until you reach the final stage and then you get the job, and then try and do something to get your adjustment in place. So being in construction, I imagine it's very different to a normal workplace, i.e. working in an office where we manage people that we don't employ, that we have a lot of stuff contracted, we have all different people, all different companies working on a project. And having spoken to other people who have disabilities, traditionally, from my experience in construction, most people with a disability have a hidden disability and they don't say anything about it. You can kind of from learned experience, you can kind of work out who does have a disability because you know what to look for. And I heard stories where someone turned up on the first day, they had a disability, and their manager found out and said, I'm not going to deal with this, you can go somewhere else. But that person actually managed to get on the job anyway because they knew someone else who knew how to deal with their disability and they did fine, I'll bring you on. And the manager found out two weeks later that person was on the job and was like, well, it's a bit late now. This person clearly shown they can do the job, they can adjust. And that in construction, I say that your biggest barrier is that people once they hear there's a disability or something similar, they go, I haven't got time to deal with it. I'll find someone else. Because there's just a big labour pool out there and just like get the next person in. And that's kind of what we I've been doing with my inclusion group is trying to raise that awareness that you don't need to be frightened. There's nothing scary about your disability. You just need to understand how to interact with the people, you know, asking them what challenges or how what do they find difficult and how can you overcome that. For example, one of my adjustments did that I won't answer the phone. They've done one to call me, I'm just not going to answer the phone. And when they complain, I'll just tell them it's your problem, not mine. Yeah more the other way we can communicate. The other thing that now I've been thinking about it in this uh, event with thought, one of the big things we do in construction is we focus a lot on health and safety and we always go, here the person in the wheelchair, this is what could happen to you if you have an accident. And we make it a big scary story like, if you don't look after yourself, you're going to be disabled. And we bring these people in to do a talk, you know, talk about why they had the accident and what happened to them, how their life would impact it. And it was always negative. So you go back to Jane's comment about, you know, people just fearful. And you need to get over the negative part about what you can't do and think about what you can do 
and how you can benefit from all the additional stuff you can do. I guess that's probably my my bit for you. Thank you, Jack. There's there's so much there that I'm sure we can we can talk about. Thank you. Over to you, Vanessa. Okay, so um, I think my view on this is um, people need to be aware and organisations need to be aware that there are increasing numbers of people in society and also in the workplace that have a disability. You know, we're living longer than ever before. We are working longer than ever before. If the government has their way, we'll be working to or in the grave anyway. Um, you know, so about at the moment, about 20% of people in the UK have a disability, which is a significant number, especially when um, employers are, you know, squealing that there is a talent pipeline crisis. Uh, it's a huge number of people that to suddenly roll out, um, you know, about one in seven of us is neurodiverse and about 50% of those people will not know that they are neurodiverse or will not have a formal diagnosis. And I think we've all heard about kind of the, the waiting lists for, for those adult diagnoses in a minute. Um, you know, 80% of those disabilities are not visible. So, you know, I think people hear the word disability, they think wheelchair, they think guide dog. 80% um, of those people are not have a non-visible disability. Um, and 78% of those will be acquired in your adult lifetime, i.e. when you are in the world of work, you might have already worked through, it through your organisation, and that can be due to accident or injury or an illness or simply age. You know, um, a lot of people find things like hearing, you know, declines as you age. So I think we just need to change the whole perception and understand that within your organization, there will undoubtedly already be a large number of people who are potentially hiding the challenges that they are experiencing right now, and therefore um, not performing at their best. And if we empowered them to perform at our best, actually that helps our organization, it helps our profitability. There is a massive business case sat there in just helping people be the best that they can be and in terms of barriers you know there's you know they break down into three please cut me off if I'm waffling here but you know there's like there's informational barriers there is attitudinal barriers and then there are actual physical environmental barriers um, and in real estate in the built environment the things that I hear um, are you know concern over stigma concern um, you know people not coming forward and being open with employers about concerns over their career progression or um, what people will have perceptions about their capability. Um, and then from a line manager's perspective, on the flip reverse, it's almost, you know, I think there's a huge concern that they will say the wrong thing, they don't know the right language, they don't know how to tackle it. And because there is a fear of saying the wrong thing, they say nothing. Um, which in itself, we need to, to normalise these conversations to take away that fear of being vilified for just using the wrong terminology. Um, I think there's a big concern about cost. There's like this underlying assumption that an adjustment will be costly or hard to implement. And we all know that that's not the case. And some of them can be very, very simple and actually be just best practice for everyone. So I think in terms of removing those barriers, it's about uh, a basic awareness for people within your organizations. I think it's about normalized conversations with everyone, not just a someone with a diagnosis about you know, how they're finding it, how they could be enabled to do their role better. I think we need visible role models, certainly within our industry at more senior levels, people who are brave enough to, to come forward and speak out and, and make other people within the organization issue go, oh, well, you know, that person's on the board and they've got X, so I can do it too. Um, and also I think, you know, a lot of adjustments policies, and this is a biggie for me, um, it's almost like the line manager feels that they have to be an expert or they have to diagnose people or they have to know what adjustments and things to, to recommend. Um, and I would say it's really important that your, your line managers are not medical professionals, they are not healthcare professionals. What they need is a clear policy that says, you know, where they go for that expert advice and, you know, be it an occupational therapy provider or a third party. 
adjustments consultant or whatever you've got. Um, and it shouldn't just rotate around a diagnosis or a label. And it shouldn't be the onus on the employee to A, declare that they have a disability or a condition because realistically that's their private information and they shouldn't have to. Um, and also it shouldn't be the onus on the employee to know what would help them best because a lot of the time they don't know. Um, so I'll probably stop there and then see if, if there's any questions that come with all of that. Wonderful. Thank you, Vanessa. Again, so so much there. Um, if I perhaps talk about my research for a few minutes and then in the interim, people, if you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat and we can um, come back to that in the discussion afterwards. So my research focuses on people with cosmetic disfigurements. I, I, I don't particularly like that word, but it's the word that's in the law. So it's it's hard to get away from. Interestingly, even though having a disfigurement doesn't usually impact your abilities, the Equality Act says that people who have long term severe disfigurements are treated as disabled people under the Act. So so that kind of it's, it's a social model link, if you like. The barriers facing people who have a visible difference, a disfigurement, tend to be attitudinal and process based. And in terms of attitudes, there's a lot of research that tells us that as human beings, we are kind of pre-programmed to associate physical beauty with positive personality traits, such as you see someone who is particularly good looking and you kind of assume that they're likely to be successful and sociable and a whole other host of things like that. But the opposite of that is true as well. So there was one study a number of years ago in America, I think, by a couple of academics called Rankin and Bora, and they showed photographs of people with facial disfigurements to a load of volunteers and, 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 and got them to sort of talk about them and, and rate them. And if you're ready for this, the volunteers found that the, the photographs of the people who had disfigurements were significantly less honest, less employable, less trustworthy, less optimistic, less effective, less capable, less intelligent, less popular, and less attractive than photographs of the same people which had the disfigurements digitally removed. Now, removing attitudinal barriers is notoriously difficult. I think it comes down to awareness. And I think that employers can certainly play a part in that change but I also think it's wider I think it needs to be um, a societal change really so so yesterday I saw um, a trailer for a new Netflix film called The Mother which stars the lovely Joseph Fiennes with a lot of um, special effects makeup to, to 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 give him a lot of scarring and and he's playing the villain and you think about the number of TV programmes and films where the baddie, the villain, is played by somebody who has a visible difference. I mean, type them into the chat box if you can, if you can. But we've got at least three Bond villains that I can think of. We've got Darth Vader, says Lisa. Absolutely. We've got the Joker in Batman. We've got Scar in, in The Lion King. The list just goes on and on and on. And so faced with that kind of media reinforcement, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's really hard to get away from those kind of stereotypes. I do think, however, that there are some things that employers can do, if not, if not to change the attitudinal bit, at least to remove the opportunity for that to be acted on. So if we're thinking about recruitment, because it's a, a, you know, like Jane mentioned, it's an obvious sort of transition time for people. There are things like ensuring that job adverts don't say something like we want someone to be the welcoming face on reception and, and stuff like that, which you do occasionally still see and which could put people off applying, making sure that your branding on all your literature portrays the true diversity of your staff, not just three people from the accounts department on a, you know, when they're all sort of fully, fully suited and booted kind of thing. So, so actually showing that diversity. Thinking about recruitment methods, which again, 
Jane mentioned, because there are some types of recruitment method that can be very difficult for, for people who are self-conscious about the way they look. And I'm thinking particularly about things like automated video interviews that I know some organizations use to, to create shortlists and things. That, that process can be, can be very difficult. And, and, and if they're willing to go through it, it might be hard to perform well. Um, think about training your interviewers about all equality issues, but include appearance bias in there. And, and the importance of being able to put people at ease when they come into the room. So it doesn't create that kind of feedback loop of awkwardness, which just prevents people from being able to do well. And as Jane mentioned, you know, maybe think beyond interviews, there are other alternative methods of recruitment. Think about things like using photographs. So it's rare now, thankfully, that you see an application that you have to send a photo with a job application. I think we left that behind in the 70s mostly, which is great. But you do still see that when people are invited in for an assessment day or something, have you ever had that thing where you stand in reception and you have to do a security photo on the machine? Oh, I mean, I hate it. I think a lot of people do. And it's particularly difficult for for certain people. So it's, it's all of those kind of smaller measures that actually aren't that difficult, um, but just require that bit of awareness and, and thought. So um, I'm actually in the process of producing a, a model of good practice for appearance inclusive workplaces. I won't, I won't plug it anymore today, I promise, but I'll send it to ACENET. And if you want to see a copy of it in due course, then, then do get in touch. So thank you. I will. I will leave that there and I can see that we have a couple of comments coming in. So uh, I think Vanessa says, if the construction industry had one key word, it would be go. How can we encourage people within the industry to slow down so change can be implemented and make the workplace more accessible? What a great question. Do any of our panelists or any of our audience members have any thoughts on how we can slow down. Vanessa. Um, I would say that um, you're right. Everything in our industry is go, go, go. And it's always the next job, the next target, the next whatever it is. Um, and slowing down is great. But I would say, um, actually, if we're, if we're going to senior leaders and saying, oh, we need to slow down, that will probably raise a huge amount of panic. <laughs> And actually, what I would say is, you know, sometimes perfect can be the enemy of good. Um, and there are very simple things, as I think a few of us have mentioned, very basic steps that can be implemented really quickly that can have a hugely beneficial impact on both your existing employees and your future workforce. Um, and I think incremental change in the way you do things that gradually improves the diversity profile of your business and the ability of people to have very normal conversations and almost just be themselves at work um, can be an, you know, a, a gradually evolving thing. Um, that's not to say that I wouldn't like to see it happen much faster than I think it does in our industry, because um, I'm a very impatient person. Um, but I would definitely say, you know, if there's one thing that you, you can all do coming away from this webinar is actually, you know, take one or two things and say, right, over the next week, I'm going to do X or I'm going to have this conversation with this person about this. Um, because there are incremental steps that we can all do that just really do help move the needle. Thank you. Very yeah, much. I'd um, echo that really. I think um, it's not a construction example, but it's quite a powerful one, though, as um, which really demonstrates it doesn't have to necessarily be slower, it just has to be different. And um, there were, was an orchestra who was very, very male dominated, and they had um, auditions, and they noticed that the people who were getting through the auditions tended to be men rather than women. And actually, the only thing that matters in an orchestra is how well you play your instrument. And so what they did was they had literally blind auditions. So there was a, a, a partition between the assessors and the musician. They put carpet down so that if people were walking in in high heels, they couldn't hear. And they purely 
assessed each musician on their ability to play their instrument. And what they discovered was far, far more females got through that process than would have otherwise um, have happened. And although that's about gender and about music, not about disability and construction, the same applies. So if we can find ways, and I can't wait, to, Hannah, to see your um, good practice guide. If we can find ways, and there are many of them, to assess candidates' ability to do the job, which doesn't involve what they look like, what gender they are, do they have a difference? Because actually all of that is irrelevant. The only relevant thing is, can this person do this job? And if we can find ways of assessing and attracting candidates that really look at a person's ability to do the job rather than what do they look like? What gender are they? Have they got one leg or two legs? It's not relevant. And um, I think for me, it's about looking at the recruitment process um, from beginning to end. So right from when a vacancy arises through to onboarding and everything in between and looking at what are the barriers that might prevent someone from progressing in this recruitment process that have nothing to do with their ability to do the job. So it's things like flexible working. It's things like um, offering, um, you know, hybrid working if it's not on site. It's things like how do you attract candidates and make it very clear that their talent is welcome regardless of what disability they might have. It's how do we assess those, those abilities. So I don't think it necessarily needs to mean that we slow down, although I do think instead of, you know, a vacancy arises, right, we need to fill it yesterday. We need to have a more strategic view about what's going to be good for the organisation in the long term. Um, I don't think it's necessarily about slowing down. I think it's about changing the way we do things. So we remove those opportunities for bias because we all have them, whether we like it or not. We do have biases against certain groups of people that might remind you of somebody that you know that you don't like you know there's nothing you can really do to change that but if all you have is the information about how that candidate can do that job that's the only thing you can assess them on and the more we can remove that potential for bias the better talent we're going to get and the more diverse talent that we're going to get thank you jane just coming back to you vanessa yeah i really wanted to to just jump in on that if i may because absolutely 100% agree or you know I was you know, clapping away there um some some really easy things that I have seen in our industry in particular because it is so fast-paced is generally we tend to have these boilerplate um like job descriptions that just go out and there's a standard bit at the top about the organization and then there's a you know, a standard, we'd like all of these things, these would be quite nice, and it generally requires that everyone has a degree and like 10 years experience and all of these things. And I would actually challenge everyone to, to really drill down into the role that they do need and what is the actual skill set, because no one is a, you know, if you're advertising for a researcher, why is it that they need to be client facing and friendly? You know, what, why do they need to, you know, be able to engage on eye contact? You know, if they're able to do amazing research, that those are the key skills. And then again, once you've drilled that right back and getting away from the, the boilerplate templates, just because it's quick and easy, again, how do we actually assess that? And a, a skills-based assessment is so much more important than an interview. Um, in so many of these roles, because at the end of the day, what you get in an interview is um, the people who are more extrovert, the people, you know, like me, who are great at just chatting away. Um, and they, you, you know, if you ask them a question they weren't expecting, basically the people who can blag it a bit, um, which is not always what you want, right? Um, so we really need to understand the skill set and how we accurately just assess that skill set and I think that is one of the biggest things around recruitment in the industry. That's wonderful thank you very much just checking that I'm not muted yes over to you Jack. Uh, but they, um, in, in terms of construction and program the most important person to involve in the conversation is the client because they take when they want the job done I think we might have lost Jack. Are you there? Um, and we've seen more now where client drafting. Am I, am I on? 
Brilliant. Thank you. Some, some, some great comments there. So there's a couple of questions and comments in the chat. So someone says, in my view, it's not simply the recruitment process that we need to look at. Agreed. We need to improve the attitude. If you change the attitude first, as well as the processes. And, and yeah, I think that's right. I think recruitment is just, just one aspect, but there's a whole lot of others, including how organisations deal with support and um, all, all sorts of other things. Gen generally a culture change as well, isn't it? And, and one thing I noted from what you said earlier, Jack, was the idea of an inclusion network, which I like because it's 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 based on facts and feedback and participation rather than assumptions. So yes, I agree. I think there's a lot more to it. Vanessa, you had your hand up. I did, yes. Um, so on that, obviously you have to look at the whole employee life cycle, not just the recruitment piece, because it's no good for recruiting amazing talent if you then lose it because it, you know, that person doesn't have the, the things that they need to enable them to succeed or the support that they have to enable them to succeed. Um, and the point about culture and um, changing opinions is is a big topic to unpick. And I think, you know, we have to acknowledge that human beings are human beings. And there are a lot of people where if we give them the facts and figures, yes, they may change their mind on certain things. But there are also, particularly in our industry, some dinosaurs that, you know, dynamo might want to blast out some of their assumptions. Um, and therefore, I think one of the things that we need to do when we look at culture change is, you know, most of our organizations have visions and values. They say we're inclusive, they say we're collaborative, um, but then unfortunately what they do is promote the people who, you know, earn the most money. Uh, the people, you know, it, it's almost like the, the values of the company aren't part of the appraisals and the promotions and what we should be doing is promoting the people who are displaying what we need them to display, i.e. empathy, the value on their talent around them, that kind of thing. And until we manage that, we will have like a top level of a business and line managers who are both focused on, you know, their P&L and their profitability and all of those things which are very important to every single business, but maybe aren't very good at bringing people with them, at understanding if an employee is ha having a bad time. You know, as you mentioned, mental health, one in four of us, right, every year is impacted by that. Um, and we need the leadership to, you know, people should be promoted on the basis of all of aspects of an organization. So if you want the cultural change, you need the, the values you want those people to exhibit to be part of that assessment and promotion type criteria. And that is a big part of it. Otherwise there is a big mismatch between what the company says it is to what it actually is when you start to work there. And that's a big problem. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, Jane, yes. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. Sometimes when we talk to employers, they'll say, oh, we can't employ disabled people yet because we haven't got the culture right and we haven't got everything in place. And I kind of get what they mean, but there's two things. One is that they will already be employing disabled people. They just won't know because people won't have told them. But the other thing is, if we say we want to get everything in place before we start employing disabled people, we're going to have to assume what disabled people might need. 
and we're going to assume wrong because we're not using lived experience to inform that. So for me, those two things should happen in parallel. And, you know, I think often when we're confronted with something that challenges our biases, you know, who would have thought a few years ago that someone who was profoundly deaf would win a dancing competition on television? You know, and I'm thinking of, um, I can't even remember her name, but the woman who got up to sing on Britain's Got Talent or whatever it was, and everybody went, oh, frumpy old woman, she's going to be useless. And then she sang like an angel. The more examples we get of having our stereotypes, Susan Boyle, that's the one, yes, thanks, Lisa. Um, the more examples we have of um, having our stereotypes challenged, the quicker that culture changes. And so for me, the more different people we can get in the organisation, and we're talking about disability today. So, yes, people with different conditions, but also people from different genders and different ethnicities and different cultures the more quickly those stereotypes get broken down, because instead of just going on, oh, everybody, as you said, Hannah, everybody with a facial disfigurement is a, 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 a villain, we start thinking, oh, actually, I know lots of people with facial disfigurements who are broadcasters or who are engineers or who are plumbers or, you know, and, and we start to, that stereotype gets challenged. And so for me, we will change the culture by changing the demographics of the people that we work alongside. And our impressions of people are often formed by the media rather than you know, by people we, we work alongside. So there's a lot of anti-refugee rhetoric at the moment, but actually we know that there are refugees from other countries who make amazing engineers and their qualifications in their home countries are far superior to the qualifications we have here. So we start challenging our stereotypes and saying, rather than saying all disabled people are incapable or all refugees are terrorists or whatever the horrible stereotypes we get, we start challenging it. So I think culture change will follow when we have more diverse people in our everyday experience, whether that's at work or at home on TV, wherever it might be. Thank you. Some, some great comments there. So we've got quite a few questions coming in and, and I apologise because I my chat box will not let me see the names of the people who's posting them. I only get three letters. So um, this might be this might be Matthew or Matty, but I, I could be wrong. Um, it might also be worth providing career paths that don't lean into social skills. Some companies align career skills with team leadership and associated social gifts, overlooking passion for the topic or knowledge. Vanessa, I saw you nodding. Do you want, do you want to come in? I can do. It's, it's something that I'm not um, a massive expert on, but I do think that, um, you know, even from where we're recruiting our talent from, we do expect people to kind of, well, certainly I... As a Tartan surveyor, you know, we expect them to have gone to one or two accredited universities who cherry pick their candidates from generally a nice posh private school who, you know, and it, it goes right the way back. And I think if we, again, it goes back to the skills that we need a person to have, just the pure skills. And then we have career paths that allow people to play to the strengths, because I think particularly we have in the industry, we want people to you know, be experts on in their bit of knowledge. And then all of a sudden um, they're a team leader and they're supposed to be a great, you know, manager of everyone. And, you know, that might not be the case. There should be a value for that person who has the, the that amazing subject matter expertise who does not want to have to deal with that and vice versa. So I think there is a case of job roles need to change to look at, you know, core strengths of individuals, not just a, a heading that was in the organogram before that we're going to keep in there because that's what the organogram says. I don't know if that's a valuable point, Matthew, or not, but um, definitely skills. Jane. Yeah, it's a great question, Matthew. And um, I ha we've noticed that some employers are beginning to change their career path um, or career progression uh, policies so that you're right that before you could only progress in your career if you started taking on managerial responsibilities. But as Vanessa says, we have people who are amazing subject matter experts, but don't necessarily have the desire or the skills to be a people manager. It's a completely different set of skills. 
And so some organizations that we're working with now have managerial path in terms of career progression, but also a professional path so that you can be promoted to being a, a, a higher expert in your um, area of expertise. And actually you can be recognized financially, job title wise, without having to manage people. Often what we find is that people are promoted to a managerial position because they're good practitioners and they may be a brilliant engineer or architect or whatever it might be, but they may not be good people's managers. And we don't want to sort of promote them, you know, the Peter principle, pro promoting them into their uh, area of incompetence. So there should be a way of rewarding people in terms of career progression who aren't going to be people managers. We don't want them in those positions. We want them in the positions where their skills will be more usefully used for the organization. So it is happening, but very slowly. And I'm not sure in this construction sector very much. I think that's such a such a great insight. Um, and yeah, particularly relevant, as you say, for construction. Um, a slightly related question here. So is there a positive way to engage with companies about being more compassionate when it comes to pulling people with anxiety or social challenges back into the office where they might feel judged by colleagues who are more confident and outgoing. So I guess it's it's to do with how do you create those workplaces where everybody feels valued, not, not just the people who are more outgoing. Any thoughts? Um, I would say that organisations, um, you know, I think there was a great hurrah when, when COVID went and everyone was like, right, it's back to the office and business as usual. Um, and, and they didn't really give any consideration, not only to, to anyone with a disability or anxiety, but also to anyone who had um, immunosuppression considerations and things like that. And also, frankly, uh, to anyone who had a long commute or children to look after or any of those things. And I think in this case, what we actually need to engage with employers about is you know, taking it away from a specific group of people with a specific condition or diagnosis and actually talking to them about having a workplace and a workplace strategy and policy that enables everyone to be their most productive. And that might be if, if someone has quiet concentration work that they need to do or a big report they need to write, they can work at home and do that because that's where they feel they are most productive. And, you know, and if they need to have a meeting and a big brainstorm with five departments, then obviously they can come into the office and arrange that and have those conversations. But I think the actual step change that needs to happen from employers here is, you know, they need to stop kind of tracking bums on seats as a way of seeing if their team are performing and actually track output and, you know, contribution and effectiveness um, and, and that impacts absolutely everyone, you know, at some point, everyone in the workplace's boiler will go down, or, you know, <laughs> the kids will be off sick from school or whatever it is. So I think that is just about employers as a whole realizing that, you know, yes, you have an office there, but it doesn't mean that if someone is not in it, and you cannot see them at seven o'clock in the morning, or at seven o'clock at night, that they are not committed. You know, you need to actually look at what they are delivering to the business and manage according to that. Thank you very much. The pandemic was a disaster, wasn't it? But one thing we did learn from it was that people work productively from home. And that this isn't just about uh, a reasonable adjustment for a disabled employee, that this is all sorts of different people. You know, we had disabled candidates who couldn't wait to get back to the office for the, you know, social interaction, but also non-disabled people who said, oh, actually, do I need to do that two hour commute every day? And so, yes, I think it's absolutely about employers saying to all staff, you know, inclusion is inclusion. Uh, we want you to work at your best. And if working from home, some or all of the time is part of that, then that's fine. And not judging people for doing that. But it's also about not then thinking, oh, we don't need to make the office environment particularly accessible or inclusive because people can work from home if they don't like it. We should also be trying to create a culture where the office environment is accessible from a physical and technological and informational perspective, um, but also from a kind of workplace culture so that people don't have to be chatty and, and extrovert, that they can be 
head down working in a corner and no one's going to judge them for that. Actually, as an employer, that's not a bad trait for an employee to have. So, yeah, it's about making sure that we value people for what they bring and make sure that we give them the environment where they can thrive, almost regardless of whether they're disabled or not. And then everybody will thrive. And that's what we need as organisations. Thank you. So there's an interesting one here from Laura. How would you advise organisations capture information on their current workforce's needs in attempting to improve the provision of adjustments? Oh, sorry, it's just disappeared when somebody posted. Considering that some members of the workforce may hide their disability. So how, how can employers effectively ensure that they're doing a really good job in terms of adjustments, bearing in mind that they may not know? what is going on in, in, in the lives of all of their staff. Jack. Hi. I think we might have some connection issues, Jack. Have we lost you? We have an adjustment policy in place that comes to me. So yeah, I'm back now. You're back now, yeah, we can hear you now. So yeah, so, yeah. They um first thing is making sure you have an instrument to deal because it doesn't matter if they tell you or not what your disability is. If someone requested an adjustment policy, then you can more or less make an assumption if you like, not correct, but you can go, okay, we've got 50 reasonable adjustments in the company that roughly how many people we've got with a disability or something similar. And if you don't have that in place, then you're going to struggle. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sorry, go on. Am I OK to jump in there? Because I think there's, um, I would say you don't need one for the other. Um, people should not have to declare people should not have to share private information. And also really you don't need a disability to request an adjustment. You know, people can request adjustments to do with their religion, uh, to do with, uh, you know, a religious festival, if they're fasting, if they're pregnant, if they're going through a different period in their life. Um, and I think, again, it's about enabling people to have a conversation and enabling your line managers to understand that what, what they have to do is enable every single individual person to work at their best, whatever that might be. Um, so yes, data is great. And if you do ask people to um, self-identify and you're capturing their diversity data across your organization, marvelous, but I think you need to be very clear about what you can and cannot use it for uh, and very transparent with people. Um, but, you know, the, the hiding of the disabilities is, is not the issue. The, the issue is you have an entire workforce who are very different, you know, um, you can't have a suite of adjustments that's like, well, this person, you know, has a hearing impairment, so this is our standard offering. You know, this person has ADHD, so this is our standard toolkit, because all of those things, even within one uh, sort of group of conditions or whatever, are incredibly different on what every single individual would need and benefit from. Um, so it has to come down to the practicalities and let, let's just step away from you know what is your diagnosis right here is our solution and go to what are you as an individual struggling with and how can we make it easier for you or more efficient for you so that you can work with that mm. and that is what the conversation should be and I think that should be the conversation for everyone not just people with disability. It kind of comes back to culture, doesn't it, that we were talking about earlier on. And I think if the organisation has conversations about difference in the same way that we talk about the weather or what was on EastEnders last night, then people will be more open anyway. So if I think somebody said earlier on, if we know that somebody on the board of directors is dyslexic, then somebody else in the organisation doesn't think, oh, if I tell them I'm dyslexic, what's going to happen? Because it's an open conversation. And it doesn't mean that everybody's obliged to share their difference. But if it becomes the norm in an organisation where we talk about those things, someone might have a disabled relative or 
uh, someone might be a carer for someone or someone might have someone might be gay or and, and if actually people are open about those differences and it doesn't matter other than people recognize oh I need to do that when I'm interacting with you then then that's actually the ideal organization so it's not about oh I'll fill this in on this form and hope nobody sees it it's more about it's okay to be different here because the culture is very accepting and open and welcoming I think that's right in the conversations I've been having with a lot of HR managers as, as part of the research project um, th there was a definite sense from a lot of them that they're trying to move away from this idea of you know you wait until someone tells you about a disability and then you say right what do you need let's do some adjustments as if it's a very reactive thing and actually obviously it's important to have those conversations when they you know if they arise but it's also important to to, to get there first and to ask everybody perhaps you know what support they need to have those conversations ongoing rather than it being sort of mechanical reactive process just sort of thing yeah um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just round up with a couple more questions. So Lisa says, we've just run a company-wide inclusion survey to gauge how people are feeling and how they want and need to work. That sounds great, Lisa. Did it, perhaps you can tell us in the chat, did it yield anything interesting? And Chris says, what can be a challenge is balancing the need of the individual with the need of the team. Vanessa said that we need to enable each individual to work at their best. And I agree with that. But the really hard thing is that enabling someone to work at their best may impact on other people detrimentally. I don't have the answer to that, but it's a challenge. What a great question. Jane, you're you're I have the answer to that one. Um, we so we at even, even break, we only employ disabled people. So that might be people who are neurodivergent, have mental health conditions. We all work in different ways. Um and we have that conversation that Vanessa was talking about with each individual at the beginning of the recruitment process, which is, we want to see you at your best. Tell us what we need to do so that you can shine in this process um, to every candidate. Um, in our case, every candidate is disabled because we only work with disabled people. But also in terms of that conversation when someone starts the business and regularly throughout, whether it's appraisals or just one-to-ones, on um, what are your needs and what are the needs of the business and then we have a conversation around what's going to work best to meet both of those needs so it isn't a case if you can have everything you want and you know it doesn't matter about the business because that's not going to work you know someone might, might say well actually I can only work for one hour a week but I'd like you to pay me full time you know that's not going to happen um, but it's about having that conversation around what do you need what do we need how can we look creatively at making sure that everybody's needs are met, including the businesses. And um, yeah, we, we seem to, it seems to manage. We seem to, you know, although we all have sometimes conflicting access needs, we always find a way through by having that open conversation. Wonderful. Vanessa, very quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on that one as well, because I, I totally agree with Jane. And I would also say that um, sometimes what a team or an individual think they need is just because what they're used to doing. And actually, if you dig underneath that, it's more the change. Um, like, I remember when everyone said they needed their own desk and, uh, you know, because they had all this paper and it'd be catastrophic if they had to hot desk. But actually, if you dig into that, it was, you know, it was other things. So um, I'm struggling to think of many examples or any, frankly, like real tangible examples that I've come across in the last five or so years that, you know, there has actually been a a real negative impact on a team or potential negative impact due to supporting an individual. Um, I, I'm happy to take that one offline um, if needs be with the person who asked the question, but it'd be good to understand the thought process behind that one. And then maybe we could come up with some more solutions, answers. Perfect, thank you. That's very kind. Perhaps once once we finish the recording, you can hang around for a minute in case they, they would like a chat, if that's all right. So um, final comment from Lisa in response to my question, 91% of people of this survey said they love hybrid working and wanted to carry on that way. I'm among them, I must say. Um, and they want to be treated as responsible adults to make their own workspace decisions and to be trusted. When you put it like that, it doesn't sound unreasonable, doesn't it? Does it? But um, but yeah, I think that sounds great. And the shirking from home idea needs needs to needs to go in the dustbin. I, I quite agree. <laughs> 
Wonderful. We're up to time and I'm conscious that it's, I don't know where you are today, but I'm in Cambridge and it's a lovely sunny lunchtime. So I shall let you go and enjoy it. Thank you very much again to ACENET and to our amazing panellists, Jack, Vanessa and Jane. I know I have really appreciated hearing your thoughts um, and thank you all for, for coming along. <laughs>